Hey folks, my name is JF. Today I'm going to talk to you about just-in-time compilation, a lecture on the last 60 years. So in this talk, I'll go through a lot of papers. Uh, you can look at them on GitHub. I posted them all, all of them there. And we also have a CPPCon Slack channel, uh, sig underscore JIT. SIG is for special interest group. So I'll cover about 20-some papers in the talk. Uh, and so that, that's quite a bit. And I'll go in through them mostly in chronological order, covering the last 60 years of research on JITs. Uh, in a way, this talk isn't my usual talk because it's more of a lecture on JIT compilers where I'll outline papers that speak the most to me right? and I want to share with you. So I'll have more text on the screen than usual uh, from the papers, and so I'll read through that with you. Now, first, some definitions. So first, JIT. Uh, JIT is just-in-time compilation. And with some artistic liberty, uh, folks nowadays usually think of JIT as uh, the executable code changes after the program's loaded into memory and the linkers and loader are done doing their, their thing, right? Uh, on modern systems, so the last 20 years or so, what that means is you have pages that are mapped as executable at some point in time, and they're modified while things execute, right? So that's roughly what people think of as JIT these days, and I'll stick to that definition. In contrast, ahead of time, or AOT, uh, uh, is, is what people usually think of, of as the opposite of JIT. Right? And roughly, nowadays, people think of C++ as an AOT model. Right? You compile code to a target machine, then you run it. Right? The, the things you've mapped as executable don't change while you execute the program. The linker and loader might do stuff, but afterwards it doesn't change. Right? And finally, interpreters. So you know, you've all used interpreted languages like you know, Python or something like that. And the, the question I want to get to is, is an interpreter a JIT or is it ahead of time? And what happens if the interpreter modifies its bytecode as it executes, right? And I want to dig a bit into that. So if you really think hard about it, the CPU, right, so the machine you're running stuff on, it executes machine code. And really, a CPU is an interpreter, right? It executes some form of instructions. An interpreter ex itself executes bytecodes, right? So I'd argue the CPU itself is an interpreter. It's really the same thing, right? It's an interpreter for machine code. Now, a compiler, right, if you look at your compiler, it can perform partial evaluation of the program. You're a program, the compiler can go in and look at stuff and partially evaluate it. Therefore, the compiler itself can interpret things. Right? And the compiler itself, if you remember, is a program. So the compiler itself can be compiled, which means the compiler compiler is the compiler interpreter. Right? But with that, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself with the uh, Futamura projection. So we'll step back a bit. We'll talk about things like that a bit later. But I'll, I'll try to outline the goals in my talk for today. Right? And I really have three goals. Goal number one is I want to convince you that JIT and AOT are really kind of a continuum. Right? Like, I'm pretty sure I confused you a bit with my explanation of interpreters, and that was on, on, on purpose. I want to kind of whet your appetite to, to change the way we see things, change the way we think about them. Because computation and compilation can occur in a bunch of places right? and at different points in time. And that's important. And I'll have a little quote for you. Uh, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that quote has been repeated quite a bit. Right? It's a great aphorism that explains a lot of stuff. Go to Tony's talk next year at CPPCon to learn more about that. Right? But you, you've all heard this quote before. And, and the reason I have this quote is because it comes from a paper I'll talk to you about in a bit. But it really outlines well my second goal of this talk. I want to look at what have JITs done, right? So, Computation and compilation can occur in different places, right? In places and times that differ. So we ought to look at where those places and times have historically been and why they've been there, right? So this is why we'll look at a bunch of published papers in the field of compilers. Not all of those papers are directly applicable to C++, but a lot of the ideas are relevant. And that takes us to our third and my last goal today. What could JITs do? Right? So instead of just looking at like what have they done and why, I also want to look at what could you do with them. Right? And the reason I want to do that is when I talk to folks in the C++ community, uh, we have the following perspective. Right? It's, it's mostly, well, I understand C++, and I kind of get assembly, or I understand assembly a lot, because of tools like Compiler Explorer. Right? I, I go on godbolt.org, and I look at stuff, and I kind of understand assembly through that. Right? Like That's how I learned assembly. I started debugging stuff and going to the assembly view and looking at things. Right? Um, 
And so our typical model of AOT is what can what C and C++ can do. That's how we usually think of AOT. And I want to expand the understanding for what other computation models exist. Right? Now, I'll give you a warning. I'll mostly avoid diving into the shortcomings and pitfalls of JIT compilers in this talk. But keep in mind that there's many of them. Right? It would take an entire second talk or third or fourth talk to go into those. Right? So I'm not trying to get everyone to JIT everything. I just want to like you know excite you about JITs and show you a few exciting things. And, and in a way, my talk could really have a different title. Uh, I, I'd call it Alice's Adventures in JIT One. Right. So so I really want to look at what can JITs do. Right. And Alice in Wonderland it challenges the reader's view. I just read it to my three year old kid, and, and he was yeah you know, didn't get all of it, but it challenged a lot of stuff for him. Right? And my goal is to expand our minds regarding what's possible with compilers. All right. So with that, let's look at our first paper that I want to talk about today. The paper title is A Brief History of Just-in-Time. All right. So this is a paper from 2003. Right? So that's important. So let's look at what it says. It starts off with software systems have been using just-in-time compilation techniques since the 60s. So broadly speaking, JIT compilation includes any translation performed dynamically after a program started execution. And the paper examines the motivation behind JIT compilation and the constraints imposed on JIT compilation systems and presents a classification scheme for such systems. So this is a great paper. If you read one of the papers I put on GitHub, that's the one you should read. It has a lot of outlines. It goes through a lot of interesting papers. It has really good references. And a big chunk of this presentation borrows from the paper. Right uh, now, notice that it's almost 20 years old. Okay, so it covers roughly 40 years of research, but there's another 20 that it's missing. So, so and you know, looking back, it's easier to look back, you know, 10, 20 years in the past. Right, so the last 20 years is a bit more muddy than the previous 40 bits. Right, so I, I, that's something to keep in mind here. This is a changing field. All right, now I mentioned Alice in Wonderland, and and there's really good insights in there. For example. This quote here, how long is forever? Sometimes, just one second. Right? And this is a really good take on JIT compilers. Now imagine if my JIT compilation is in a foreground thread blocking interaction for an entire second. Right? That animation that I just had on screen was kind of slow. It was just one second. Right? And you're like, come on, give me the words, give me the words. So contrast this with your usual C++ project build time. One second sounds amazing. Right? If your C++ project built in a second, that would be so cool. So clearly, JIT authors wouldn't want to block your interaction this way for like a long time because you're waiting for stuff to happen if it's in the foreground. And, and that means the design space is really worth considering. Right? It's not the same as just like, well, your compiler can take forever. It can't take anymore. Right? Like it has a lot of stuff to do, and the, it's waiting, the user's waiting for something to happen. All right. So let's look at another quote. Strictly speaking, JIT compilation systems are completely unnecessary. They're only a means to improve the time and space efficiency of the program. After all, the central problem JIT systems address is a solved one. Translating programming languages into a form that is executable on a target platform. That's all they do, right? Alice really knows about that, right? So she knows how to trade off space and time, right? She drinks bottles, gets big, gets small, Falls the rabbit around, she's out of time, things like that. Right? And to root this into C, imagine that you're templating all versions of function based on all valid integer parameters which could which it could receive. Right? That's a whole bunch of space and a whole bunch of time to compile it. Right? Your program's gonna be ginormous if you do that. Template explosion is the thing, you gotta be careful with it. So clearly we want to do some trade-offs here. And, and so to explain that, I'll, I'll go into the four key benefits that JIT systems have that they gain from AOT and interpreters. Right? And there's really four of them, and I'll dive into those. So benefit number one, compiled programs run faster, especially if they're compiled into a form that's directly executable on the underlying hardware. Makes sense. Static compilation can also devote an arbitrary amount of time to program analysis and optimizations. By now, we've already discussed this. So this brings us to the primary constraint of JIT systems. Speed. So a JIT system must not cause untoward pauses in normal program execution as a result of its operation. Now, this is really broad. What constitutes an untoward pause really depends on the system. It really depends what the JIT's doing, whether it has background compilation or not, a bunch of things, right? 
Advantage number two, interpreted programs are typically smaller, if only because the representation chosen is at a higher level than machine code, and it can carry much more semantic information implicitly. Now here, think of examples where a single bytecode instruction might do, say, a full matrix multiplication, right? or it might change the prototype of a class. There are much higher level primitives than even what a CISC processor can do. Right? Now JITs can benefit from this uh, size savings by only compiling the code that matters right? and leaving the rest in a compressed form. Right? So interpreters are really good at size. A JIT will compile stuff and expand it to the target architecture, but the JIT can say, this is an important, I'm just going to keep it for an interpreter and the rest I'm going to choose. Right? So that's one trade-off that JIT's going to Now, advantage number three. Interpreted programs tend to be more portable. Right? They work on different machines, different architectures, different uh, uh, operating systems more easily. So assuming that a machine-independent representation, such as a high-level source code or a virtual machine, only the interpreter needs to be supplied to run the program on a different machine, right? So the, like, I, I don't know about you, but like, I've never ported Python code to a different architecture. It just kind of works. There's stuff that cannot work, but that usually works. So of course, the program still may be doing non-portable operations, but that's a different kind of thing, right? So if you expose, say, like system or something like that, and you just shell out, if the shell doesn't exist on the target platform, of course, you're not portable, right? But at, by and large, interpreted languages are pretty portable. Right? And that's a huge upside for programs that are entirely jitted. Even though the JIT itself has to be compiled for the target architecture, the rest of the program doesn't necessarily need to be. Right? You can still expose non-portable stuff, but there's kind of an ease where the, the program that's being jitted can be easily portable. Now let's look at the fourth and last upside to JITs. Interpreters have access to runtime information, such as input parameters, control flow, and target machine specification. And so like, what machine are you running on? What instructions does it have and stuff like that? How many cores are there, things like that. Uh, this information may change from run to run or be unobtainable prior to runtime. Right? You don't know what the control flow is gonna be until after you run the program. Additionally, gathering some types of information about a program before it runs may involve algorithms which are undecidable using static analysis. Right? So there's a lot of pro problems in compilers. The compiler has to just say, too complicated, can't solve that. Right? Like, we're not trying to solve the halting problem. In a lot of cases, compilers will like, you know, iterate a bit and then be like, eh, this is probably pretty complicated. I figured out what I wanted. I'm not going to prove the rest. Right? Uh, uh, whereas like, if you run the program under a JIT, you can just kind of narrow to the execution that actually happens. You don't need to prove entire things. Okay. So interpreters simply know more about the program, and JITs can control such information and optimize accordingly. Right. Another example, think about LTO or PGO, right? So link time optimization and pro profile guide optimization in C++. It gives a lot more information to the compiler. Right? And that type of information is what a JIT can gather at runtime. Same thing for an interpreter. Um, another thing is, is a JIT can speculate on certain facts being true, optimize accordingly, and then roll back if it turns out that it was wrong. Right? So where static compilers don't do that as much. They can, but it's, it's a bit more complicated. All right. So let's, let's go back in time now and look at the very first JIT systems. And back then, they weren't called JITs, right? But they were JIT systems. Okay, so now we have an idea of why you'd want JITs, right? Through our four key criteria. So we'll go just roughly chronologically and see how stuff evolved over the last 60 years. Now, the first published thing that seemed to be a JIT is this one. Recursive function of symbolic expressions and their computation by machines. This is a paper that outlines Lisp. Pretty old language. I think most of you know about it. And the paper says values of compiled functions are computed about 60 times as fast as they would if interpreted. Compilation is fast enough so it is not necessary to punch compiled programs for future use. Okay, so this is the first published paper that talks about JITs. There are quite a few like that in the 60s, and they're kind of quaint. They do different things. Uh, so for example, uh, when they speak of punching compiled programs, they actually mean punch cards, uh, not punching the program because it's not fast enough. Okay, so... It's quaint, it's a really cool paper, it talks about S expressions and things like that, it's worth watching. All right, so next paper I wanna tell you about, and it's not the second published paper on JITs, but it's, it's one of the first. Uh, there's this one on regular expression search algorithms. Uh, it was written by this guy called Kay Thompson, who probably did other stuff in his life, uh, but it's another quaint paper from the 60s, really interesting. And it starts off by saying like the compiler consists of three concurrent running stages. Stage number one, Syntax C that allows only syntactically correct regular expressions to pass. Makes sense. Stage number two, convert the regular expression to reverse Polish notation. 
final stage of the compiler, object code producer, which expects a syntactically correct reverse Polish regular expression. Pretty simple JIT, three steps, you've got to compile it. That's pretty cool, right? Now, you know, we don't always JIT regular expressions nowadays, uh, but you can get really good speed ups if you do. All right, next paper I want to tell you about. We're going to jump a bit forward now. This one is efficient implementation of the Smalltalk 80 system from 84. So Smalltalk 80 programming language includes dynamic storage allocation, full upward final arts, and universally polymorphic procedures. The Smalltalk 80 programming system features interactive execution with incremental compilation and implementation portability. Right? Again, portability is a key feature here. These features of modern programming systems are among the most difficult to implement efficiently, even individually. Right? And they have all of those wrapped into Smalltalk. So it's really interesting when you read this paper, it's pretty short, but you see what authors call out about their work, right? They thought this was worth publishing, and they talk about what was actually considered hard back then. Now, it might still be hard today, but I think it's very interesting to see what they outlined here. And so, in particular, full upward fun art sounds really cool, but it's allowing you to pass a function with its closure. And that was considered really, really hard back then. Um, and so, the paper dives into important optimizations for small talk itself, right? So, it discusses things like macro expansion of V code into N code with caching. So, in other words, there's an IR before the machine code. And that was pretty innovative back then. All right, let's look at another paper that's real interesting. Optimizing dynamically typed object-oriented languages with polymorphic inline caching, 1991 self. So polymorphic inline caching picks achieve a median speed up of 11%. As an important side effect, picks collect type information by recording all of the received types actually used at a given call set. Right? So self is a dynamic language, and, and types can change over time. Right? It's not like this class. The class itself can change over time, and picks collect the information, and then optimize based on it. All right, the compiler can exploit this type of information to generate better code when recompiling a method. Interesting. An experimental version of such a system achieves a median speed up of 27% for a set of self programs, reducing the number of non inline messages sent by a factor of two. Right? So, self, if, if you're not really familiar with it, it's a precursor to JavaScript. Yeah? So, it has prototypical inheritance, which is kind of like changing the V table of a type at runtime. Right? So, you can go in and say, you had these methods, now you have those methods. Right? But the key thing is that rarely happens in practice. You don't really change your, your type's uh, uh, behavior that much over time. And so polymorphic inline caches come in, and while you execute stuff, you record what you see, and you check against the common case of runtime. So at runtime, you need to say, hey, did you change anything? And if you didn't change anything, then you go to the fast path. right? And you, you can kind of expand a bunch of stuff. So it's a really cute optimization which tries to make the language's dynamism more static when it actually is static. So that's cool, and you discover a runtime. All right, so let's go back to our friend Alice here. Alice says to the cat, would you like to tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? The cat replies, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And Alice, perplexed, says, I don't really care where. So the cat finishes with, well, it doesn't really much matter which way you go, right? But the key insight here that the cat has is, Figure out what you're trying to do and why it matters. And there's a more grown-up way to say this. Uh, it's in a paper uh, by, by Urs Hosler, uh, where he says, in the course of our experiments, we discovered that the trigger mechanism, when, is much less important for good recompilation results than the selection mechanism, what. Right? So same as the Cheshire cat, Urs figured out that uh, uh, what you do matters more than when you do it. And so what you optimize is way more important than when you optimize it for longer term payoffs. So maybe you can take a bit more time and optimize the important functions, take a bit more time, look at what's actually hot, look at what the behavior actually is, and, and what you need to include inside your optimization instead of optimizing the first thing you see. And that's kind of interesting. All right, so let's look at a bigger system that does optimization. The system is called DPF. It's a fast, flexible message demultiplexing using dynamic code generation from 1994. So it's described as a new packet filter system, DPF, that provides both the traditional flexibility of packet filters and the speed of handcrafted demultiplexing routines. It, it goes further. DPF filters run 10 to 50 times faster than the fastest packet filter reported in the literature. Right? So what it's doing is it's filtering network packets really, really fast. 
That's cool. So DPS performance is either equivalent to or when it can exploit runtime information superior to hand-coded demultiplexers. DPS achieves high performance by using carefully designed declarative packet filter language that is aggressively optimized using dynamic code generation. And so like what this does, right, when you want to filter packets coming in and you have a multi-user system, is you, you want user space to say, like, this goes to me, do this on do this on these packets, do that thing. And user space can dynamically generate packet filter code to steer the network packets directly in the kernel. Now, the thing that's cool about this is this is safe, right? So the kernel needs access to all the packets that come in, right? And in general, that's how traditional networking works, right? Like the, the kernel has access to the networking hardware and user space asks the kernel to steer stuff. DPF allows you as a user to inject directly into the kernel, unknowing what the other user space processes are doing or where their packets are, right? Now you want this to be fast and DPF was the first one to kind of explore doing that really quickly by having some form of JIT that's safe in the kernel. And DPF was part of a bigger project called, called Exokernel. So there's another paper, Exokernel, an Operating System Architecture for Application Level Resource Management, 1995, which says, in the Exokernel architecture, a small kernel securely exports all hardware resources through a low-level interface to untrusted library operating systems. Hard coding the implementation of these abstractions is inappropriate for three main reasons. And so here, they outline why Exokernel is really cool. Right? Reason number one. It denies applications the advantage of domain-specific optimizations. All right, interesting. And two, it discourages changes to the implementation of existing abstractions. And number three, and it restricts the flexibility of application builders since new abstractions can only be added by awkward emulation on top of existing ones if they can be added. Right? So DPF is part of that system. And Exokernel has a bunch of small things in, that it does to export hardware capabilities to user space. Right. And the rationale for exposing hardware interfaces instead of abstracting them away are really, really similar to the rationale we've discussed uh, for using a JIT. Right. So this is at the OS level. You're trying to give more flexibility and dynamism to the user space programs. All right, cool. So talking of user space programs, uh, there's another type of JIT that I want to tell you about. And, and the first really nicely pioneering paper that does that is called Adam. And instead of showing you a quote from the paper, I'll show you code. So Adam's from 1994. Here's what it does. It starts off and you say instrument in it. And you say like, you know, do these things. I'd call prototypes and whatever. And then if you look at the loops, right, an instrument, you say, well, guess, get the, the first procedure in the object. For that, get each block in the procedure. And for that, get each instruction in the procedure. If the instruction type is a load, add a call before it. If the instruction type is a store, add a call before that, right? So Adam is a system for building customized, customized program analysis tools. And it's generally called dynamic binary instrumentation in other papers. So this simple Adam program, like I'm just missing in main here, uh, but this is the entire program. It instruments all of an already compiled program's loads and stores, right? And it adds a call to a function, a function call before every load and store. So therefore, Adam disassembles a program, all of the program, instruments it, then reassembles it. Right, fixing up everything and executes. That's that's really really cute. Um, and there's another paper called Pin that does the same thing. There's a lot of papers in that field. I won't talk about Pin in details it's from 2005, but it goes way further than what Adams uh, does in its work for you. All right. So now that we know how to like instrument programs and do a bunch of other stuff, let's flip and use GIFs to do something completely different. There's this program called Embra, Fast and Flexible Machine Simulations from 1996. So it's a simulator for the processor, caches, and memory system of uniprocessor and cache-coherent multiprocessors. It uses dynamic binary translation to generate code sequences which simulate the workload. And Embra can simulate real workloads at speeds only three to nine times slower than native executables of the workloads. So it can customize its generated code to include a processor cache model, which allows it to compu compute the cache misses and memory stalls of uh, uh, time of the workload at a slowdown of only a factor seven to 20. All right, so simulation, let's step back a bit. What's simulation? It's the process of running a native executable machine code for one architecture on another architecture, right? So you say, say you have like some ARM processor you have, and you have an x86 machine, you can simulate the entire ARM processor in the x86 machine. And dynamic binary translation is the execution of the program from one instructions architecture, an ISA, into another or the same ISA. And so it's performing the translation dynamically. 
In other words, it disassembled the binary as you execute it and reassembles a completely different binary. And Embra was uh, simulating MIPS RF3000 and 4000 on SGI systems. Right? And that's kind of interesting because <clears throat> the main reason this is useful is, is, is to develop new hardware. Right? Either hardware for ISIS that exists, but you're changing the hardware, or for ISIS just don't exist. Right? So say you're developing like ARMv20 or something right? that doesn't exist yet, but you still want to simulate it, see how it works and things, write a compiler for it and target it. You use a simulator for that. Right? And, and so when I started working on a CPU like 11 years ago, it wasn't obvious to me that what you would do. Right? I didn't know how CPU development worked, but that's, that's in large parts what they do. They use a simulator or multiple simulators, and they simulate what the target hardware does with varying accuracy. Right? So you might want to only simulate architectural states, so registers and memory. Or as Embra says here, uh, you might want to simulate other details that are non-architectural, such as you know, the shadow registers, the caches, and other stuff. Right? So the caches have some architectural behavior when you're like doing the multiprocessor, but by and large, the reason you simulate caches in a, a, a uniprocessor system is to just like you know, see how the cache system works, right? And um, you also want, might want to do like timing of instructions, right, to see how fast your processor is going to be. Do caches, memory, and a bunch of other stuff. And this is really, really, really slow to do an interpreter, right? Uh, because you do a lot of checks and a bunch of other stuff that's really redundant. And Ember is the first machine simulator that used dynamic binary translation to do that instead. And so you don't, like, you know, the process, the simulator doesn't know what program it's going to run. Say you're going to boot Linux on, on your simulator or whatever. Like, that might do a bunch of stuff. You might go on the internet, download a bunch of stuff and things, like, in, in the simulator. Embra can't hardcore all of that, but it can jit it as it goes. And so the speed numbers quoted here seem really slow, but they're actually quite good, right? Embra can change the functionality of the simulator too, which is cool, right? You can say like, start up, simulate the cache, and then don't simulate the cache later. You can do those two things, you just have one simulator. That's kind of cool. All right, so let's look more at dynamic optimizations. This system's kind of cool. Uh, Oberon 3 has a paper called Dynamic Optimizations from 1999. And uh, the description of it is, is Kistler looked at cache optimizations, rearranging fields in a structure dynamically to optimize a program's data access patterns. And a dynamic version of trace scheduling, which optimizes based on the information about a program's control flow during execution. The continuous optimizer itself executes in the background as a separate low priority thread, that's cool, which executes only during a program's idle time. And so Kistler, who's the author of that paper, used a more sophisticated metric than straightforward counters to determine when to optimize and observe that deciding what to optimize is highly optimization specific. Right. And that's an interesting optimization, same one that Erst did, uh, which, which is kind of interesting because Erst was on Thomas Kistler's PhD advisory, advisory board. Kind of makes sense. Um, but but to, to explain what Oberon does here, right? Uh, C++ programmers are pretty familiar with doing array of struct, struct of array, tr array transforms, right? You do that manually. You have an array of structs, you're like, ah, oh, this is kind of slow because cache locality and stuff, let's do struct of arrays, right? Uh, but there's so much more theoretically that could be done if we could figure out the ABI concerns, right? So if you're able to change the layout of a class or you know, arrays or whatever else, not caring about the ABI, you could change stuff and really optimize things really well based on the, the, you know, the locality of accesses and stuff like that. And so that's what this paper did, right? Uh, trace scheduling reorders code based on what's likely and unlikely and can inline based on this information. That's really, really cool. And this therefore changes the structure of data at runtime as well as the code structure at runtime. Right? And that, that's a really cool aspect of JITs, right? We've talked about JITs generating uh, different code at runtime and changing it, but it can also change the structure of your data at runtime, which is like a key thing that JITs do really well. All right, let's look at a similar system called Dynamo. It's a transparent dynamic optimization system from 2000. Uh, it's a software dynamic optimization system that's capable of transparently improving the performance of the native instruction stream as it executes on the process. Right? It focuses its efforts on optimization opportunities that tend to manifest only at runtime, and hence opportunities that might be difficult for a static compiler to exploit. Okay, so we looked at previous systems that did translation from one architecture to the other, or from a high-level language to like assembly and things like Dynamo takes your binary and executes the same the, the binary on, on the same CPU that you ent intended to run it on, right? So it translates from one ISA to the same ISA, but it optimizes the code, right? Whereas Adam went in and used the JIT to instrument the code, Dynamo just explodes your code, says, these instructions are useless, throws them away, and then assembles a faster version of your program that has exactly the same behavior. 
right? And you can also optimize, uh, um, say you run a program under Dynamo, and that program is a JIT itself. Dynamo can handle a JIT within a JIT, right? So you can JIT the JIT, right? And technically, it could JIT itself, right? Um, so it doesn't require user guidance to optimize nor multiple runs, which is really cool, right? So it's not like a PGO and LTO type thing. You just kind of run it, and then as you run, it figures out properties of the program and optimizes those important parts. Uh, so you just run the program in Dynamo, you get faster stuff. And so their numbers, uh, at the time they ran spec, 90, spec into 95, and it, it went from dash O level uh, performance, so O0 basically, to the performance of O4, right? So you, you, if you run a, a O0 program under Dynamo, you get O4 level performance. Right? But you, you know, your static compiler runs for a short amount of time because it's just no optimizations. And then Dynamo just sees what's important to optimize and optimizes that and nothing else. That's kind of cool. Right? And again, like take this with a grain of salt, right? Like maybe the static compiler wasn't that great or whatever else, but like this is a cool system nonetheless. All right. And so related to that, there's a really good quote from another paper that says, by far the fastest simulator of the CPU, MMU, and memory system of an SGA multiprocessor is an SGA multiprocessor. That sounds like a tautology, right? But in other words, what this actually says is when the source and target architecture are the same, as is the case when the goal is to dynamically optimize something, right? then the source program can be executed directly on the CPU. Right? And so remember the slowdowns that we quoted in Embra about simulation? If you simulate on the target architecture itself, right, then you can erase many of the performance costs. And that's, that's kind of cool. Right? All right, so I'm going to change topics a bit. I'm going to apologize. In advance, I'm going to use a swear word. Okay. Java. I'm sorry, I said it. I said I said it. I said Java at a C process conference. I'm sorry. I said it. But at least I didn't say Ross. Okay. All right. So let's look at Java for a bit. It's pretty good. It actually does cool stuff. So let's look at it. There's a cool paper called Compiling Java Just in Time. Right. And their pitch was avoiding unnecessary overheads is crucial for fast compilation. Right. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. In many compilers, constructing an intermediate representation of a method is a standard process. When compiling from Java bytecode, however, we can eliminate that overhead, so the overhead of creating an IR. But the bytecode themselves are an IR. Because they're primarily designed to be compact and to facilitate interpretation, they're not the ideal IR for compilation, but they can easily be used for that purpose. So if you remember, back in the 90s, early Java was interpreted and it was slow. Right? And so it had a fundamental design criteria, which was Java has to be portable and it has to be secure. Right? And making that means that they designed an IR, uh, well, a bytecode that had those fundamental properties and creating a compiler for that at the time was kind of tricky. So it took a while, but an interpreter was kind of easy, but it was slow. Right? So the key thing here is the bytecode in Java can't be trusted. Right? Because it has to be secure, you don't trust the bytecode, you check a lot of invariants at runtime when you interpret it. Right? Now, realistically, most, most bytecode is not trying to mess with the program. Right? And so you could actually do away with a lot of those things. But they're dynamic properties, so you still have to check. right? Like, Are you accessing the right out of bounds and stuff like that? You have to check all those things. Um, and classes uh, in Java can be loaded at runtime. And that complicates things a lot. right? So it means that like everything in Java is virtual basically right like it, it's as if all the methods have virtual like kind of plus in them but if you can load classes runtime it means that dynamic dispatch is nearly impossible to determine statically right so there's all these kind of things in Java that made it hard to optimize right and then what this paper talks about is is, is kind of saying well it's really key to a JIT's design which IR you use here they said we're not going to use an IR we have bytecode Bytecode's good enough to jitting. Uh, it's fast, right? We don't need to take the bytecode, create an IR, and then do stuff with it, right? Um, that's an interesting fact, right? Like, if you want to do stuff fast, skip steps in a JIT, right? If you don't need that step, don't do it. And this, doing exactly what they did, has deep effects on which optimizations are feasible. That's really, really important in understanding how JITs design their IR. Because when you design an IR, you're trying to enable semantics as well as, as enable particular optimizations. Right? And there's a trade-off with speed and a bunch of other stuff there. Uh, so in particular, some information is lost when you translate from original source to IR in a lot of cases. Right? And also, some IRs have easier to analyze structure. So for example, um, you might have an IR, which makes it super easy to say, I have an instruction here, creates a result. Who uses that result right, in this function? That's really easy to do, say, in SSA or something like that. 
Um, another thing is if you have a nice control flow graph, it's real easy to say like, okay, I'm here in the function. How can I get there? Right? You can say like, I'm at this. Can this point in the program get there? Well, if you have a control flow graph, it's kind of easy to say. If you don't have a control flow graph, it's hard. Right, so IR design is really key to JITs, and a lot of the Java uh, publications talk about IR design, either saying we just have bytecode, whatever, or by having really complicated IRs. All right, so let's look at another example of a later Java uh, JIT. So this one's called Hotspot. I think you've all heard about it it's from 2006, and this this paper is, is about the design of Hotspot client compiled for Java six. And it's a bit complicated because like there's like the client and the server compiling a bunch of other stuff. Let's ignore that for now. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the paper itself talks about many, many interesting aspects of the JIT. Right? So it has novel contributions to the field of JITing, but its description of prior art is also super good. Right? This is a really good, great paper because it looks at stuff other people have done, and it puts it in a hotspot, explains how everything's integrated together. Right? So even though the thing itself might not be novel, how it integrates with the big system, right? Like if you have a one trick pony paper, uh, uh, this thing, it's one trick, is putting all the tricks into one trick, right? So that's cool. Uh, so it refers back to publications that originally pioneered stuff. So it's kind of cool there. Uh, so the paper itself also, also does other stuff. It talks about like a fast, fast algorithm for scale analysis, which was novel, automatic object inlining, which was novel, array bounds check and elimination, which was novel. Um, but where Hotspot is really, really cool is when everything comes together in a pretty complex JIT and runtime that has good performance. Right? So let's look at interesting bits that it points out that aren't quite novel. Right? I'll talk about that. So it says, if a method contains a long-running loop, it may be compiled regardless of its invocation frequency. The VM counts the number of backwards branches, right? so when you go to the top of the loop. Uh, and when a threshold is reached, it suspends interpretation and compiles the running method. Right? A new stack frame for the native method is set up and initialized to match the interpreter stack frame. That's a key point. An execution of the method then continues using the machine code of the native method. Switching from interpreted to compiled code in the middle of a running method is called on-stack replacement. So most of the time, when we think of JITs jumping uh, uh, to code, it's to the entry of a function. Right? In most cases, uh, you have a function that has a single entry, and then you might have a switch that goes into different parts of the function. But if you're stuck in a hot loop, right? imagine you're in a really hot loop, and that hot loop calls other things, goes back, calls other things, goes back. You can't go to the start of that function. You're in the hot loop already. Right? You've decided, let's look if this function is hot, and then you never get out of the function. So it's really hot, but you're never getting out of it. Uh, so this is where OSR comes in. So OSR is effectively turning a function inside out. You're in that hot loop. Right? or in you know, multiple hot loops in the same function, jumping back and forth. And you, you kind of turn the function inside out, allowing you to jump into the, say, top of the loop or something like this. That's really cool. right? So the, and what's cool is the interpreter has a state, right, which is pretty big. And, and OSR in the JIT matches the state of the interpreter. So you can jump back and forth from that entry point, either running the JIT or the interpreter. Right? So, and it preserves all the semantics. And that's a really key optimization there. Let's look at another one. <clears throat> the compiler creates debugging information that maps the state of the compiled method back to the state of the interpreter. Right? We talked about that earlier. This enables aggressive compiler optimizations because the VM can de-optimize back to a safe state where the assumptions under which an optimization was performed are invalid. So garbage collection and de-optimization are allowed to occur only at some discrete points in the program called safe points, such as backwards branches, method calls, return instructions, and operations that may throw an exception. All right. So first, I've always found that the concept of an optimizer de-optimizing is amusing. Just, it, it's funny, right? But here's a concrete, concrete example of de-optimization. Uh, when I was saying earlier, Java can load classes dynamically, and you can do that through the network. And you, you launch a lot of Java program, you go get a, a thing like over the internet, you load it, and you execute on your program. So statically, you can't determine any of that, right? So some functions might have been inlined, right? Because you're, you're saying, well, like everything's virtual, but I want speed, so I'm going to inline some stuff, right? Uh, so I'm, it looks like this is final. I don't see any of the versions of this method. I'm just going to inline everything. And then the programmer, who's kind of a jerk, comes in and loads stuff through the network or whatever, some of the, the, the hard drive or something. That's kind of a jerk move. The compiler has to see that, and it has to de-optimize it. Right? But that really doesn't happen that often. Right? So do you want to say, I'm never going to align anything in case the programmer is a jerk? Or do you want to say, I'll trust that you're not a jerk, but I'll verify? Right? That's, that's what this does. Right? So de-optimization kicks the executable back to the interpreter. Right? So you have this super-optimized thing 
the optimizer says, whoa, 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 hold the horses. Something I don't like happened. It's kick you back to the interpreter, right? But in some cases, you might actually have multiple tiers of compilation, right? So you don't just need an interpreter and to code. In some cases, you have an interpreter, you have like that fast-ish, pretty good optimizer, and then like a really fast, but like really, really good optimizer, really slow, but really good optimizer, right? So you might actually like, Go from the interpreter to tier one to tier two, back to tier one, back to tier two, back to the interpreter. Like you, you can do that in JIT, right? Obviously, if you jump back and forth, you're just spending your time optimizing stuff and jumping back and forth, not doing anything useful. But the key to being able to do that, right, is having this kind of debug information on the side and having specific points where you can de-optimize. And it happens that this is also good for the garbage collection, right? Because the state is really well known. The JIT can do a bunch of fancy stuff, but then when the GC comes in, it, it has a kind of like nice state of things to look at. So that's a really, really key part of, of certain VMs. All right. So Java brought the term just in time into common use in computing literature. So that's Gosling looking back at where things came from. And so thank you, Java, for the good stuff you did. And also thank you, Toyota, for the borrowed word just in time. That's pretty cool. Okay. Stop talking about Java. All right. Let's look at another cool paper called, and I'm not sure how to say it, but I'll just say it, FX Bang 32. I'm going to say FX Bang 32. It's cooler than FX 32. So it's a profile guided binary translator from 1998. Now, it starts with really, really, really big, big mood here. Because digital alphas architecture provides the world's fastest processor, many applications, especially those requiring high processor performance, have been ported to it. Cool. However, however, and here I added the frownies. However, many other applications are available only under the x86 architecture, right? That's a bummer, right? Like my alpha code, okay, but like x86, yeah, okay. But they designed digital FX Bang 32 to make the complete set of applications, both native and x86, available to alpha. The goal for the software is to provide fast and transparent execution of x86 Win32 applications on alpha systems. Fun fact, there was Windows 32 on Alpha. Did you know? FX Bang 32 achieves its goals by transparently running those applications at speeds comparable to high performance x86 platforms. That's a cool thing, right? Like they had they're running x86 code on Alpha fast. Digital FX Bang 32 is a software utility that enables x86 Win32 applications to be run on Windows NT slash Alpha platforms. Once FX Bang 32 has been installed, almost all x86 applications can be run on alpha without special commands and with excellent performance. Three significant innovations of digital FX Bang 32 include transparent operation, interfaces to native APIs, and most importantly, profile directed binary translation. So by now, you know these words, you've heard them, right? But they put them together in an interesting package. Right. Their claim is they're the first system to exploit this combination of emulation, profile generation, and binary translation. And what's really, really cool about this is that uh, applications run unmodified on a different architecture and effectively a different operating system. If you know it's still Windows, the operating system is actually different. And this makes transitioning architectures much easier, especially if the destination is more powerful, which is the claim here. Right? They say alpha is the fastest processor in the world. And like, yeah, at the time, it was pretty exciting. Um, so were one to launch a system like this nowadays, it would be a huge deal, right? Like marketing would be involved, they would talk about it, they would have like key names for that product and things like that, right? Like if, if ever anyone launches something like this, a new architecture and they port old code, say from x86 to their new architecture, they'd make a big deal out of it, right? And this in 98 was quite a big deal. It was really cool. I still think it's really cool. I still don't know how to say it though. FX Bank 32 sounds weird. Okay, let's get back to Alice, right? Alice has really, really good insights into JITs. So let's look at what she said. Why? Sometimes I have believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast, right? <clears throat> now, Lewis Carroll really knew his JITs, right? And here, he's actually talking about speculation. Right. So we talked about speculation a bit in the context of hotspot, where right? we say the program is not a jerk, they're not going to load like something from the network a class, and now I'm going to have to deoptimize. Right. But there's a lot more speculation that you can do in JITs. So let's, let's look at some deep speculation and much, much cooler emulation. Right. This is really cool. Transmeta, the technology behind Crusoe processor from 2000. So their tagline, the start of the white paper, this isn't really an academic publication, it's a white paper that exposes the architecture. 
It's a low power x86 compatible processor implemented with, and wait for it. If you know what's coming, just don't spoil it for the other people in the room. It's implemented with code morphing software. Wow. The new technology is fundamentally software based. The power savings come from replacing a large number of transistors with software. Right? So this, Transmeta, was the hottest startup at the end of the 90s. Right? So for those of you who remember Slashdot, uh, Slashdot was a buzz with this. Right? It was really cool stuff. And code morphing, uh, just, sorry to spoil it, code morphing is just fancy with say dynamic binary translation. Right? But, but this is actually really cool. Imagine, this is hardware that presents as x86, but it's not actually x86. In fact, they didn't have a license for x86, but they just emulated it. Right? It's also hardware that can get faster through firmware updates, which is either terrifying or amazingly cool. It can be both at the same time, actually. And it's a stable seeming ISA, right, x86, with hardware that can radically change at each generation, right? And it did radically change through its both generations of transmitters processors and the third one that they never launched, right? But it had radical changes. It's really cool. All right. So now I'm going to apologize again for the wall of text, but it's a really exciting wall of text. Let's look at it. The VLIW's native instruction set bears no resemblance to the x86 instruction set. Cool. It has been designed purely for fast, low-power implementation. The surrounding software layer gives x86 programs the impression that they're running on x86 hardware. The software layer is called code morphing software because it dynamically morphs x86 instructions into VLIW instructions. The code morphing software includes a number of advanced features to achieve good system level performance. Code morphing support facilities are also built into the underlying CPU. And this sentence says a lot, right? This, this is really important. In other words, the transmeta designers have judiciously rendered some functions in hardware, some in software, according to the product design goals and constraints. Last in the wall of text, different goals and constraints in future products may result in different hardware software partitioning. So let's unpack this. VLIW is, means very long instruction board. So on Crusoe, each actual instruction is really four different simple instructions. Right? The hardware executes VLIW, what they call molecules, in order. So this is not a super scalar processor. Right? It takes each, each molecule and executes them one at a time, in order. But that's four instructions at a time. So there's some amount of stuff happening at the same time here. The other thing is this is a binary translator. So it's the instructions in VLIW are executed in order, but it's actually statically out of order from what the original x86 program contained because of binary translation, right? And so it means like the, the translator moves stuff around and then executes in order, right? So you don't have all that super scalar hardware that tries to reorder stuff, has a ton of shadow registers and other things and renaming and, and things, uh, uh, but, but it's able to still do out of order things. So the hardware itself right, supports transactional memory in hardware to enable speculative optimizations, including uh, speculative reordering of loads and stores. Right? And x86 instructions are initially interpreted, and if they're deemed hot, the JIT inside the CPU uh, compiles them to a hidden part of the hardware. So this is effectively running at ring minus one. Right? Like the x86 code can't access the JIT, can't access the memory to which stuff is JIT. So I don't know about you, but this wall of text gets me pretty excited, right? And at this point, you're going to say, well, nothing can really impress me anymore. Well, let's look at QMU, right? QMU is a fast and portable dynamic translator, and they present the internal of QMU, a fast machine emulator using an original portable uh, dynamic translator. It emulates several CPUs, x86, uh, PowerPC, ARM, and Spark, on several hosts, x86, PowerPC, ARM, Spark, Alpha, and NIPS. QMU supports full system emulation in which a complete and un unmodified operating system is run in a virtual machine and Linux user mode emulation as well, where a Linux process, just the process itself, uh, uh, compiled for one target CPU can run on another one. Right? So you can emulate the whole machine or you can emulate just one program in that whole machine. All right, so QMU sounds less grandiose than Transmeta, but it's a one-man uh, uh, project initially. Right? It's grown a lot since then. And it's really impressive that one person wrote all of that original thing. The paper itself is really tiny, really cool to read. Uh, and QMU is super malleable, right? So it does a bunch of interesting optimizations, it's super portable, and the paper itself is short, but what the project does is pretty close to magic, which is why it's used in a lot of places these days. Right? So I don't want to go into virtual machines and say what VMware and other people have done, but there's a lot of interesting work in virtual machines in general. 
And so particularly when you use special hardware to help virtualization, uh, uh, like run the guest operating system. So in particular, uh, in virtualization extensions, uh, you have hardware support to do a lot of interesting stuff, as well as all the pair virtualization techniques where you tell the, the guest that you know, there's a host running them and they kind of cooperate to do stuff. So that's really cool. All right. That's another thing. This one is pretty familiar to most people, Valgrind. Uh, it's a framework for heavyweight dynamic binary instrumentation. And the paper says, we focus on Valgrind's unique support for shadow values. It's a powerful but previously little study and difficult to implement dynamic binary analysis technique, which requires a tool to shadow every register and memory value with another value that describes it. All right. So what's cool about that is it kind of takes what Adam does, right? So in instrumenting stuff, and it goes way beyond in the analysis capability. I didn't just let you add function calls and stuff, but Valgrind uses shadow values to track facts about registers and about memory and things like that, and knows about the guest operating system and stuff. And so folks are usually used to Valgrind as a use after free tool or an out of bounds tool, but that's just one tool that's part of the Valgrind toolbox. What's really cool about Valgrind is, is the tooling infrastructure around it, right? That the way you write a tool is you don't really need to know about JITs, right? You manipulate a program if you write a Valgrind tool without knowing about JITs. It just tells you there's a program running, there's a state, tell me what to do with this stuff, right? And that's what's really cool about Valgrind, and it talks about that in the paper. All right. Here's another one, JavaScript, trace-based just-in-time type specialization for dynamic languages. So uh, it identifies frequently executed loops based at runtime and then generates machine code on the fly that's specialized for the actual dynamic types occurring on each path through the loop. Uh, they've implemented a dynamic compiler for JavaScript based on their techniques, and they've measured speed up as 10x or more on certain benchmarks. Now, there's a lot to say about the evolution of JIT compilers in the last, like, 11, 12 years once browsers started just compiling JavaScript. Right? There's a lot to say. There's a lot of blog posts, not as many publications. Uh, but there's many person decades that have gone into optimizing JavaScript, and your mobile devices are way faster because that, or their batteries are much smaller. That's really good. Uh, so I'll only mention this paper because I, I think it's cool. It uses trace compilation. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of like what Oberon did. Instead of looking at a function at a time, it just kind of traces through the actual execution, right? which is cool. Uh, so pen and transmeta also did that. It's either called traces or regions, depending on what you do exactly. And so uh, it really traces through the execution and it kind of blows away what a function is. And so it kind of implicitly does inlining as well as tracing through types, right? Because if you follow a thing as it executes, the type tends to change along certain paths. And so that's really, really cool. Uh, some stuff happened to traces after this paper, but let's, let's just ignore that. The paper itself is cool. All right. So dynamic or just-in-time compilation is an old implementation technique with a fragmented history. And by collecting this historical information together, we hope to shorten the voyage of rediscovery. Right? So this completes our brief history of JIT compilers. But there's one more thing I want to mention. All right. And what's that one thing that I want to mention? Well, security. All right. Again, let's look at the cat. The cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked good-natured. And she thought, still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth. So she felt that it ought to be treated with respect. And I said I wouldn't go into downsides of JIT compilation too much, but I want to just like quickly go through a few papers about security because it's kind of cool. And, and the reason I want to do that is the good news with the JIT is that you're now shipping a compiler. You can do all these things. It's really, really cool. I'm excited about it. Um, the bad news about JITs is you're now shipping a compiler, right? So here's a few more publications. I'll gloss over them a bit. They're cool still an active area of research, right? So the first one I want to talk about is not actually a JIT. It's native client. It's a sandbox for portable untrusted x86 native code. So this uh, native client, this paper, talks about x 32 but there's variants of it for x 64 32-bit ARM v7 ARM, as well as MIPS32. Not covered in that paper. There's like subsequent things on the internet about it. So it's not technically a JIT, but it's interesting because these seven rules, right, don't bother reading them. They're kind of the material. There's seven rules that you have to follow at the instruction level, right? So you assemble a program, look at the instructions, and you don't need to know much about the OS. You don't need to know anything about the compiler that generated that assembly. You, if these seven rules are followed in the binary, then you know that the, the, the binary can't do anything malicious. It's safe. Right? That's really, really cute. Right? And further, NACL uses segmentation to, to kind of enforce some of those things in x 632 And it effectively has a Harvard architecture where code and data are separated. Right? And so 
you can do this type of proof at the assembly level in JITs, right? Not necessarily these ones. You don't necessarily need to use segmentation, but there's a lot of really cool trades that you can do if you prove particular properties about code, right? So your JITs could be completely untrusted, complete crap JIT, but if you have a program that checks what the JIT generated afterwards, you can actually make sure that the JIT gen didn't generate anything too bad, right? That's one interesting thing that you can do. Um, so so I, I think that's really cool. And it, NACL, as I said, has versions for different architectures, and there's a subsequent uh, program called Portable Native Client, so Pinnacle, uh, that, that made NACL portable. Now, what it did is a bit like janky. It, it runs LLVM inside of a NACL sandbox, and then LLVM, which you really don't trust, uh, generates NACL code inside your browser, and then you validate the generated code before executing it. Right? So you don't need to trust LLVM, you just need to run it. NACL, LLVM itself is sandbox. The code it generates, you, you see that it follows the rules of the sandbox, and then it's safe. Right? So it doesn't break out of the sandbox. And like, you know, Chrome has a vulnerability reward program. This was part of Chrome. And as far as I know, nobody's ever claimed any vulnerabilities on it. Right? So it's, 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 you know, it's had people poke at it a bit and, and nobody's found any flaws as far as I know. So that's kind of cool. And the techniques that it outlines are really cool. Right? The idea of proving that a binary can't do anything malicious. Now, in fact, some people have tried to attack JITs, right? As soon as JITs started happening in browsers, people started trying to break them, and they still do, right? So here's a paper that does that really well. It's called Attacking Client-Side JIT Compilers, 2011. So, you know, a few years after JITs started existing in browsers. And so it says, while the concept of a compiler producing incorrect code is not new, JIT engines raise the stakes by performing this compilation at runtime with potentially under the influence of untrusted inputs, right? Like you just download JavaScript from the internet, execute it. No idea what it is. The common weakness enumeration guide only contains one mention of compilation-related vulnerabilities, and that mention concerns compilers optimizing away a security check. Right, so it doesn't talk about JITs at all. So one concern with complex JIT engines is a compiler producing correct code at runtime through either miscalculation of code locations, mishandling register states, bad point of dereference, and a bunch of other stuff, right? So this paper is really cool because it breaks down a bunch of actual flaws in real production JITs. I think it's like four or five of them. Well, there, there's like three that are the same ish, but you know. Uh, uh, what's nice is that it also proposes concrete mitigations for the flaws that it outlines, right? And that's really cool. And since then, JITs have changed significantly, in some cases, uh, thanks to hardware support. Uh, but if you look at publications, there's a lot of stuff published by uh, Google Project Zero on their website. They have a lot of really great deep dives into breaking various JITs and stuff like that. Here's another cool paper, LLVM to JavaScript well, a compiler called Emscripten. Right? So Emscripten is compiling LLVM to JavaScript, which opens up multiple opportunities to run code on the web. Right? Uh, so Emscripten can be used to compile C and C++ code, as well as like you can take, say, a Python VM, which is written in C, compile it to Emscripten, to LLVM, to JavaScript, and then run Python code on the web. Or you can do the same thing with Lua. It has a lot of cool things, and later on, there's this thing called ASMJS that came in, but it's basically hijacking JavaScript to do something it wasn't designed to do. And with ASMJS in particular, which, is, which was published after the Emscripten paper, uh, it gives JavaScript a whole like C-like type system. Even though JavaScript's dynamic, it makes it static. Right? So that's cool because Emscript doesn't need to know about security that much. It just tells the browser, you, you take care of the security, I'm going to give you code, and then you JIT and whatever else. That, that's kind of a cool approach. All right, final thing I want to tell you about. WebAssembly. Uh, so there's a paper that, that uh, me and a few other people wrote called "Bringing the Web Up to Web the Web Up to Speed with WebAssembly." So what we did is we looked at what Enscripten did and ASMJS and Macro and Pinnacle, and we're like, this is kind of like all over the place. Let's make something that's principled and well made. Right? So we got together four major browser vendors, uh, and we designed a low-level bytecode called WebAssembly. Uh, it offers compact representation, efficient validation and compilation, and safe to uh, and safe low to no overhead execution. That's cool. And rather than committing to a specific programming model, WebAssembly is an abstraction over modern hardware, making it language and hardware and platform independent with use cases beyond just the web. Right? So it's neither web nor assembly. It's not assembly, and it can target other stuff in the web. Let's ignore that part. WebAssembly has been designed with formal semantics from the start, which is pretty novel. Right? Like It has a formal model that explains how the VM works. And that's, that's really, really novel. Uh, and we describe the motivation, design, and formal semantics of WebAssembly and provide some preliminary experiences with implementation, right? And what's cool is WebAssembly programs run inside a browser, so say Chrome or Firefox or Safari or whatever, and the virtual ISA is well-defined and can target all these OSs and architectures differently, right? So it pretends to be a modern CPU, but it's actually quite portable, right? And WebAssembly itself can be compiled when you get the program or like JIT compiled as well. 
while still being secure, right? Because when you have stuff in the browser, you don't want it to be able to skip the sandbox. All right, so this concludes our talk. Thank you. So I'm JF. Uh, I talked to you about just-in-time compilation. It was a lecture on the last 60 years. If you want to look at GitHub, all the papers are there. Again, uh, we have sig underscore jit, S-I-G underscore jit on the uh, Slack channel. And uh, I'll take your questions afterwards, maybe either on sig jit or we'll do an AMA or something. Thank you.